all through college, like I was running like progressively larger businesses. So like literally from the first day I stepped on, on campus at CMU, I was scheming up little business ideas. So the first thing I did was I realized that like kids at CMU were selling textbooks in a Facebook group for like much less than they would cost on Amazon. So I started buying books in the Facebook group and selling them on Amazon and sort of pocketing the difference to the point where it um, really helped me pay for school after my uh, scholarship. Welcome, 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 friends. Today I am joined by Spencer Burley. Spencer was the first person that Hero mentioned. If you guys have seen Hero's interview about the gap year, I believe Spencer and him used to run this little investment club back at Exeter together. So Hero mentioned that Spencer would be a really interesting guest. And then I emailed all of the kids in my high school class of 2016 and Spencer actually volunteered, believe it or not. But yeah, before we get started, Spencer, do you want to give like a quick 30 second intro about who you are? Yeah. So hi, my name is Spencer uh, Burley. I went to uh, Exeter with Kevin, graduated a few years back with him. Uh, after Exeter, I went to Carnegie Mellon, where I studied uh, statistics and computer science. Uh, I did that for a few years before um, leaving my degree to start a company called Rent the Backyard, where we build little houses in a factory that we then install in uh, backyards across the San Francisco Bay Area. So the idea is that it's a really great way for homeowners to make some extra money, and it gives more people an affordable place to live. Dang, he's got the pitch nailed down. That's probably your like 270000 time you said that <laughs> i know it i i you certainly uh, spend a lot of time doing it yeah all right all right well let's rewind a little bit so we have teenage spencer can you tell us a little bit about your transition from exeter to carnegie mellon what was that like uh yeah i think it was like a, a transition of like a few bumps but I, I think it was a really rewarding one that i really um got more of once I sort of leaned more into it. So like Exeter was a certainly a much smaller school, like 300 people in a class composed to, uh, compared to Carnegie Mellon, where you have like 12 or 1500 people in a class. So that the size, I think, immediately kind of struck me. And I wasn't as sure how to like get around a place that big. Like my thought at Exeter, I always like to kind of drink out of the fire hose and try to just like subscribe to all the email lists that existed and try to get like a really good understanding of like what was going on on the campus. And like you could just barely seem to do it at Exeter. But like CMU, you could just not do it at all. So I had to kind of adapt and, and come up with like new ways to try to figure out like what was going on on campus. After I figured that out, I think things went a lot smoother. Gotcha. What was the um, transition like academically? Did you think CMU was harder than Exeter, easier than Exeter? So my first year was definitely a lot of like repeat of stuff I'd learned in high school. But then when my second year hit, I, I went from doing economics and statistics to statistics, to, to statistics and computer science. And I, I did not have as much experience there and it was a lot harder. So it, it was kind of ramped up very quickly. I see. So, yeah, I mean, computer science at CMU is only like ranked, you know, like the best in the nation. So obviously <laughs> it's going to be a little I've heard. I've heard that it's quite difficult. So what led you to drop out or leave CMU? You decided to start your own thing. Yeah. So my sophomore year, I joined a, a fraternity and I met Brian, who would eventually become my co-founder. And we just spent a lot of time together during like, my sophomore and, and junior year talking about different business ideas. And we actually um, started a few little businesses. So we had one where we um, replaced uh, our fraternity, our fraternity to chef. And Brian figured out that the chef was spending $5 of the $7.50 per person per meal he had just on himself. Like he was just paying himself an egregious amount. And Brian was like, huh, well, uh, Pittsburgh has a lot of really cheap local food. What if we just like replace the chef with catered meals? And uh, so we did that and we ran that for a while. And that was really rewarding. We really liked working together. And then we started to have um, bigger ideas. So we went and we uh, had a couple of different ideas and we applied to a startup accelerator called Y Combinator. We were fortunate enough to get admitted. Uh, so sort of once we had that, we kind of knew that we were we were doing the company and we were going to go and um, uh, I made the decision to leave. Wow, that's so exciting. Okay, so you left during sophomore year to join Y Combinator? Uh, end of my junior year. End of your junior year. Okay. Do you have any plans to go back and finish your degree? Or are you going to stick with Rent the Backyard for the foreseeable future? Yeah. So like I, I focus primarily on Rent the Backyard, but uh, like Zoom University has created some interesting opportunities. So there's definitely um, sort of that draw of I'm, I'm not so many units away from, from a piece of paper. And my, my mother has gotten a little aggressive about it. So um, <laughs> maybe I'll scheme something up. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I 
we also interviewed for Y Combinator while we were at Yale for, for an idea. So I remember what that was like. Really, really awesome. I think a lot of, it's like a dream for lots of college entrepreneurs to get funded by YC dropout. I mean, if there was uh, a young entrepreneur who was looking to form a legit startup, get into YC, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I think that um, a lot of people seem to think startups are just kind of like a binary thing or like running a company is just kind of a binary thing. But I like to see it more as like a gradient. So like, all through college, like I was running like progressively larger businesses. So like literally from the first day I stepped on, on campus at CMU, I was scheming up little business ideas. So the first thing I did was I realized that like kids at CMU were selling textbooks in a Facebook group for like much less than they would cost on Amazon. So I started buying books in the Facebook group and selling them on Amazon and sort of pocketing the difference to the point where it um, really helped me pay for school after my uh, scholarship. It, it's just kind of like, I, I see it very much as like kind of ramping up rather than just like jumping in the, the deep end and like making the decision to like, oh, I have an idea and I'm going to immediately drop out for the idea. So I think like taking time and care and like really getting comfortable with the water before you make a decision is really important. Working on your startup and having it be as uh, like meaningful and real as possible is definitely helpful too. I love that advice. That's really, really wonderful advice. So speaking more about the idea for Rent the Backyard. Uh, how did that come up when you you and your co-founder were just after a late night of partying at, you, at your frat, you guys were sharing some beers and it came up? <laughs> so like, I've always been really interested in urban planning and like was definitely interested in like coming out to California. Uh, but I just kept reading all these different things about the way that California had kind of failed to meet the um, demand for housing that exists. So like we're at a point where the state needs to build something like 45,000 units every single year just to keep rents from rising. Wow. And the state just doesn't build hardly any units at all. So well, that was always kind of like a like a thing that I personally really cared about. And I see it as like kind of an economic empowerment thing where uh, if housing is too expensive, people can't kind of move to the place that they're able to best meet their potential. So many people are just kind of kept from reaching their potential. Uh, so I really wanted to do something about that problem. So I kind of kept reading and kept nerding out on these different urban planning things. And eventually we came across these new laws that had just um, been introduced and allowed um, people to go and really easily build a unit in their backyard, their underutilized space. And I just got really like enamored by that idea because so often when we talk about like the housing crisis and things going on here, it's really kind of like a homeowner versus renter situation. But backyard units really feel like a, a solution to the housing crisis kind of everyone can get behind because homeowners can actually benefit from taking their underutilized land and, and adding a unit there. And um, renters, of course, can benefit from the the increase in options and um, presumably as the supply increases, the decrease in cost. So um, we wanted to really jump into that market and try to make it as easy as possible for homeowners to go and uh, actually do that. I absolutely love that. I think that's so inspiring. Honestly, you guys identified like a burning problem. It's nowhere. I think that California is the place where it's like most serious. And clearly you've articulated that this isn't just about buildings. This is about opportunity and making sure that, you know, people have a chance to go where um, and live in these, these places. I think that's that's amazing. So tell me a little bit more about this timeline for Rent the Backyard. Um, when you guys interviewed for YC, you know, what stage were you guys at? Did you have an idea on a napkin or were you guys building prototypes or like revenue generating because I'd sold like many units? Uh, when we applied to YC for this idea, we were certainly closer to like the idea on a napkin stage, but like we had a lot of other ideas too. So like um, in, in many ways, like Brian and I are kind of like idea machines and we're always thinking about like, how, how can we like take this thing and um, run like an interesting process over it? So our, our catering business was very large at that point. We just didn't really want to stick in the food industry. So, I, and like my personal like e-commerce business had grown from like just textbooks to outdoor supplies and all sorts of other things. So I, we were running like a few, a few different businesses at that point, which I think certainly helped our candidacy because it showed that we had been able to like actually like ship something and, and build something that a lot of people were using. I think uh, as a college student, like you are really constrained by capital most of the time. Like I was always funding those businesses like off credit cards or something like that. So when we thought about like the opportunity to dream bigger and actually get like venture funding, we thought, went to like the, the problem that we thought was the most burning and pressing. And um, we were lucky enough to be uh, that other people agreed with us and funded us for that. Okay, cool. Can you talk more about um, the timeline after you guys got into YC? So you're funded. Um, obviously, YC gives you a little bit of money in exchange for equity of the company. And then what happened there? Like, when did you guys get your first customer? Or what was that timeline? like? Yeah, so we, we did, we started actually more in the financing space of units. So um, uh, if you do you know what a solar lease is, Kevin, or I, I can just... 
<laughs> Please explain it. <laughs> yeah. So companies like Solar City go and um, they will put a solar panel on your roof at no cost to you. And then each month they'll bill you like your electricity provider. Uh, in, in that case, like more people get solar, um, but also like people don't have to spend like tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket. Uh, so we wanted to copy that model to backyard homes. So that was our original business model. So we went through Y Combinator in summer of 2019 and ran with that initial business model for about six or eight months. After working with a lot of different like contractors and construction companies, we kind of came to understand that a lot of like the bigger issue to like people being able to build these backyard homes was on the construction side. And um, that's when we teamed up with actually a great team of uh, architects over at Anderson, Anderson Architecture, uh, who have designed all sorts of little like modular homes and been on like that route. Like received numerous awards and, and all sorts of things like that to go and try to build our own units. We now like uh, build entirely our own units in our own factory from our own design. And we use a new building material called cross laminated timber, which is like a structural steel alternative that's much better for the environment. But each house is basically made up of 12 big panels of wood that come with the doors and windows cut out of them that we then like form into a basically like Lego box that we then protect on the outside and make nice on the inside. Uh, so that makes you it's a lot faster. And we've been doing that business model for a while now. And we're, we're sort of in the process of shipping units to customers as we speak. Spencer, you said that so casually, dude, you are like just <laughs> building enormous homes. They're not, they're not that enormous, actually. I guess it's more in line with the tiny homes. So they're, yeah, they're 418 square feet. They're a one bedroom, one bath. Uh, they're 12 feet by 35 feet long. Maybe you could like overlay some photos for your viewers or something like that. I can send a bunch of those. It's really visual. For sure. Yeah. The, the website was so clear and easy to understand. Stand, and it was just like two or three pages really well designed i mean yeah especially you just said that so casually you're like 23 oh. 22 <laughs> years old just you know building homes at first we found this problem so then we decided to take it into our own hands and now we have a factory and we just build homes that's that's ridiculous well well so one thing i think about like running a business is is really that like no one's gonna ever believe in you as much as you and, and no one's ever gonna care as much as you if you can't like be the person like everyone that you talk to is gonna care a little bit less than you so like you need to project that like idea of caring and that idea of confidence and mm -hmm. like be really compelling because everyone else is going to do it a little bit less than what you put out yeah that makes sense all right so when it came to rent the backyard well actually when it comes to rent the backyard today what does a typical day look like as spencer cfo of this san francisco startup like can you walk us through almost like an hour by hour i know every day is different as an entrepreneur but maybe you can go over some of the main blocks. Sure. So I actually spend um, most of my days at our factory over across the, the Bay Bridge, about 15 minutes away in Oakland. So I do that all the days of the week, except for Thursday, which is kind of like my work from home day, but different activities. I'll usually come into the office, check my email, see what's going on there. Maybe walk the, the, like the factory floor, talk to some of our employees and about what they're sort of going to accomplish on the construction side of things for the day. I might spend the first hour or so doing that once in a while. I'm trying to get a lot better about this, but uh, probably like once or twice a week, I'll spend an hour or so at Home Depot shopping or picking up for different things uh, that we just need. I spend a lot of time just on procurement and trying to come up with ways to like make the construction processes as efficient as possible and like as easy as possible for our team to get done and to save money for our customers. We now are open for like in-person, like socially distanced visitors. So we'll have maybe two or three of those come by every single day. So either Brian, my co-founder, I will walk them through the show unit, answer any of their questions and just try to help them see the product and visualize it for their yard. Uh, once in a while, we'll actually visit people at their home as well. So we'll drive out uh, maybe 30 minutes to, to visit a backyard, take some measurements. I spend a lot of time doing different design as well. So I'm doing a lot of our customer proposals that we're putting out for people, designing things like our website, our, our advertising and other things like that. So really varied, kind of a hodgepodge each day, but that's kind of where I spend the majority of my time. What would you say is your most favorite part about the job? I really enjoy being able to make like so like oftentimes in construction or when people think about like companies in general, they think like, oh, I really need to like make something like two times better or 10 times better. And like, it, it's certainly like, it, it's the most compelling if you can, if you can do that right off the bat, but you can get to improvements that are really sizable like that by just improving like one or 2% of like all these different processes and really sort of be able to add that. So I really like thinking about like, how do we drive the forklift in a specific way? Or how do we pick up a big panel of wood to save 15 minutes here, 30 minutes there in so many ways, like each unit we build 
build is a combination of uh, materials and like just people time. So being able to reduce people time and uh, make materials more efficient is uh, really enjoyable for me. Yeah, it reminds me of the like 1% rule. If you can make everything 1% more efficient, what would you say is your least favorite part about the job? So we're still a pretty small company. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that um, I don't really like multitasking, but I find myself multitasking a lot. And like, I I happily do it. And like, uh, I think like oftentimes that I'm multitasking, so others don't need to multitask. But um, I think that uh, as we get bigger and um, more people are around to do little uh, sort of disjoint tasks, uh, I'll be able to be a little bit more efficient. Gotcha. How big is your team, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, We have uh, four or five people right now. So cool, cool. Uh, How do you manage your team, Spencer? I'm actually kind of curious because I, as an entrepreneur, that was probably the biggest struggle that I had. I like can barely manage myself. Yeah, I I think it comes down to like empowering people to to do the right thing and giving them the tools to do their job as as well as you can. I think like just trust is so important in all of these relationships because like personally, like you you aren't getting anything done if you're just micromanaging employees. So being able to have people that can go out and like get things done on their own, who you really can empower to do that is super important. Startups oftentimes don't seem to have much of a hierarchy in their org charts, which I think is, um, I I haven't run a a very large company, but the consensus is like that works until like 10, 20 people, something like that. Mm. Um, Because of the nature of our business and how like human centric, a lot of processes are like, if we're successful, we're going to scale past that really quickly. So we're trying really at this early stage to go and to put a, a strong org chart in place so that people have direct reports and direct managers and, um, you cap those numbers. So people um, don't have too many people to manage or or too many people to report to. And I I think that's really important as you scale, being able to keep everyone like on the same page and pass information down through the appropriate channels uh, really efficiently. Maybe we can zoom out just a little bit. I'm going to ask you about some more high highs and low lows. Over the course of like your entire startup, what would you say has been your highest high and lowest low? Highest high was probably like the completion of our initial unit or like actually opening the um, the factory we had. Yeah. So we're in this like giant like warehouse that used to manufacture steel and it's been really cool to like get into that space and like see things get done. Lowest lows probably involved pivoting around in new business models as we like realized the financing one wasn't working out as much. So being able to like abandon something that you'd worked hard on and like in many days you kind of work like a negative day. If like you go into place like YC and you um, have like a different idea than the one you eventually end up with kind of like your work like negative days on your startup the loss of like all that work is difficult but at the same time you learn a lot and that's all you can can do and uh, you really have to just take like the lessons you learn and, and build a better business from that so yeah tell me a little bit more about your factory i'm really excited about it how long did it take to get that set up and when did your factory open yeah so our factory opened back in september we've gone and uh so like we're, we're moving very quickly and, and really scaling fast the factory itself took like three-ish months to open yeah a lot of the work was actually focused on like finding like an industrial space with a really big door because like we build our units like to 95% complete in the factory, put them on a truck and drive them to customers' homes where we use a big crane to put them in the backyard. But in order to do that, you need a really big door to like be able to drive the units out. And almost all the doors we found were like 10 feet by 10 feet, which is like a standard roll-up door, but we needed like 15 feet by 15 feet. So we were really lucky to find a really great place um, over in Oakland in that old steel building I mentioned. Um, we actually share part of the space like with Lyft. And they keep like a bunch of cars that they rent to drop people who want to make money with it but don't have cars so we're constantly seeing like banged up cars and all sorts of other stuff but it's a it's a really fun environment to be in yeah that's just a funny image to think of you and your co-founder having a talk like how big is the door though <laughs> you guys scouting out these yeah yeah, yeah. no and so if you want a startup idea right commercial real estate is like it's so hard to find like and, and everyone moves really slow we went through like three different brokers only one of them was kind of moved at the speed we wanted got to the point where like Brian and I were looking over this website called LoopNet which is is like straight out of like 2000, 2001, but there's like almost no information on these spaces that you're going to spend like literally tens of thousands of dollars every single month renting. We go and like, we'd be like, oh, it was like these two pictures and like, how big is that door? And like, let me like call like the listing agent up and you're like, do you know how big the door is for this address? And you're like, no, but like, you can meet me there tomorrow with a tape measure. And like, that's not helpful. <laughs> Like, <laughs> so if there was some way to like come up with better, like commercial real estate, like listings, um, that would be a startup I'd invest in. That's, that's a classic. 
real steak and you can come with the tape measure. That's what they told you. Yeah. Sometimes they do it themselves, but like that's that's almost as bad, right? Like the real estate agent has to drive 40 minutes just to answer a question for a prospective client. Like it's just dumb. All right. So how many units have you guys installed? Curious. Yeah, we're shipping out our first batch now. Um so uh, doing doing installations and things like that now. Gotcha. So you guys run them in batches. So you build them all and then you you ship them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we actually just uh, a week or so ago started a new batch of uh, two units. Uh, so we're super excited for those. And I've been spending a lot of my time recently on like the act of like taking these 12 panels and putting them into four walls, four ceilings and four floor panels. Yeah. So what's your long-term plan for Rent the Backyard? I believe you guys are just operating in California right now, but um. You know, do you have plans for international expansion and domination, world domination? Are you guys looking to get acquired or you want to run the company forever? Oh, so I don't really like this type of question because like, it's just such a like unknown. And there's so many different ways that our business could change and the market could change. And I think if you're like a good company, you're going to adopt to like the changes that get put in front of you. So right now, like California has introduced all these great laws that make backyard homes really easy. And like our buildings are certified at the state level. So like right now we're in the Bay Area, like probably we'll go to LA uh, or like San Diego or places like that. But I don't really know what happens after that. And and I think that's okay. And, and being kind of aware of like, okay, like we have these four or five different options, like maybe we'll build bigger buildings if some state laws allow that or maybe we'll build adus in oregon and washington or across the country or maybe we'll um we'll do something else entirely uh, in the construction space because we're accumulating a lot of really great knowledge around how to build buildings really efficiently so i I think like we have an idea of like some of the really exciting opportunities that could exist for our company but like we're going to stay nimble and responsive to like what's happening in the market and what's happening with laws since so much of building is just so constrained by things like that gotcha Okay. Those are pretty much all the questions that I had prepared for you today, Spencer. Is there anything else that you want to share or talk about? Um, Knowing that, you know, this audience is a mix of some high school kids who are about to enter college. Some of them are pretty interested in entrepreneurship. You know, some of, some of the viewers are already in college. I share the best piece of advice I've ever um, gotten about like this whole world. And and that is um, don't shop advice. So like in so many ways, like I think a lot of people, especially young people that like don't really feel like they know what's going on, uh, will go and like they'll try to just like collect opinions from people about like what they should do. And that can be helpful, but oftentimes people will actually go and they'll look for like the opinions that they want to agree with and they'll create like a Frankenstein of of sorts of advice. And, And I think like the healthier thing to do is to come up with some advisor who you like continue to trust and continue to go back to um, who can continue to help you and gain context over time. Uh, But I also think it's important to really remember that like you're the person that's going to know the most about your business and you're the person that's going to be able to, you're the person that's going to care the most about your business. And if you have a co-founder, then like you're on equal footing with them. And I definitely would recommend getting a co-founder, but like Mm -hmm. a lot of confidence really has to come from within. And I I think believing in yourself is just so important um, because people can and do change the world by doing that. Yes. You're going to believe Believe in yourself and care about the project the most. And how can you communicate that to others? Well, clearly Spencer has communicated his love and care for Rent the Backyard. It's like more than a company and it's more than just, (laughs) I'm really, yeah, I'm really, I'm really feeling super inspired. I tried to start a startup in college. It didn't quite work out. Now I'm running my own little tutoring shop and I've found a little bit more success there. I think, like you mentioned, there's so many different ways to approach entrepreneurship as well, whether it comes from like, you don't necessarily have to, if if some of you are in college and watching this and you're thinking about like starting your first business, exactly like Spencer described, I think starting with a little snowball of an idea, a little, a little seed and then letting it snowball, excuse me. Um, you know, even if you start by making just 50, a hundred dollars and think about how you can repeat that, who your customer is, one thing will lead to another. And just, you learn the most from experience and kind of failing. Well, that's pretty much- And I think a lot of snowballs that you start pushing, like they, they won't work. And like, that's expected, right? If they worked, it would like everyone would do it. So I, I think so much of this is about like, um like shots on goal or like the number of snowballs you push. And like, if one snowball isn't working, like go to another one. And like, oftentimes the people that succeed the most are the people that fail the most. So- that's super important too. Yeah. I remember um, a really shocking statistic, which was that it took the average entrepreneur three or four businesses before they had their first successful one. And then what Spencer mentioned today, which him and his co-founder, Brian, right? You guys would just hang out and bounce ideas off of each other. Again, like good ideas are a function of just the number of ideas that you guys are able yeah. to work with. Wow, Spencer, I feel like I feel like I'm speaking to a wise old sage. Like you have so much. To- <laughs> I'm like gushing. I really admire the work that you're doing there. It's very inspiring. 
Oh, thank you very much. John. Well, I'm so happy and glad that we got the opportunity to chat. It's literally been years since I saw this man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been a long time. But um, yeah, really great to catch up with you, Kevin. And yeah, yeah, happy to chat with any of your viewers further. Um, My email is just my first, first dot last name at the backyard.com. Awesome. I'll, I'll link it up. Well, thank you, Spencer, so much for your time. I know you're a busy man. So the answers you gave were also super brief and concise. So thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch I've been there. conditioned well. So. I know. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Why Combinator questions, which are like 20, 20 seconds or something like that. But anyways. Yeah. I think my interview was 10 minutes long. And I don't remember any of it. Really, you did a good job. You impressed them with your entrepreneurial streak and your business <laughs> acumen, Spencer. Thank you guys so much for joining and tuning in. I hope you learned something new and we'll catch you at the next one. Bye guys.